I use this trainer to teach students about sensors. But honestly, I'm not sure I knew how a few of them were. Let's see what we can learn today. I have Will Healy with Balaf with me today, who knows everything there is about sensors. The first one you have there is an inductive prox, right? And an inductive prox, it's creating a, an eddy current out in front of the sensor, and it's using looking for metal. So when metal enters that field, it, it detects the metals there, but it's looking specifically for ferrous metals, so like iron. So anytime you have a metal part that you're working on, or a part of a machine, a lot of people use a linkage, right? Do I know a linkage is up? There'll be a prox, is the linkage up? And there'll be a prox down. One thing you do have to be careful of is uh, the type of metal. So if you're detecting aluminum or copper or something like that, it has what's called a D rating. And so you have to have that correction factor. It's going to be closer. So the less ferrous metal in it, it this, the material has to be much closer to the sensor. Next one you have there is a, is a retroreflective prox. This one's really great. It uses a reflector. It's probably the most common that you see in packaging because it's the best of both worlds. With the reflector, you don't have to have electricity on both sides of the application like you do with a through beam. We'll talk about that in a second. But you get the light to go out and the light to come back. So you kind of have, I know the sensor is working because the light went out and the light came back. So you have really good reliability of a retroreflective, and that's why people use retroreflective a lot. That was my next question is, why even use the reflective one when really the diffuse could do the same thing? But okay, I get it. Now we know that the beam has gone out all the way to where we want it and it's come back. Totally. Diffuse can be a problem in a number of ways. It relies on the reflectivity of the object. My black shirt that I'm wearing here today, it's going to absorb more light, right? We know that from science class in high school. So it actually has to be closer to the sensor. So you can have issues depending on the object with a diffuse sensor because you're relying on the reflectivity of the object. The diffuse has another variant, it's called back at, background suppression, you hear a lot. And background suppression is basically just allowing you to adjust in and out where the switch point is. A lot of people use it on a belt. They're pointing the sensor down and they don't want to detect the belt, but they want to detect the object on the belt. But diffuse is common, but it's the least reliable, but it's the simplest to implement because you just have one component to mount. Through beam is the next one you have there, and that's the one, yeah, awesome, right? So you have the emitter and you have the receiver, and for me, it's where I always try to get people to start. Anytime you can have the emitter on one side, the receiver on the other side, and you're sending light across, that is the most reliable switching technology. But you have to have electricity on both sides, and that can be hard in application, especially if you got like two conveyors right next to each other. You can't get another sensor or electricity in the middle of those two conveyors next to each other. It gets a little bit hard. I always advise people to start with through beam. Let's look at retro, and then if we can't do those two, we'll talk about diffuse. Moving on, you have ultrasonic. I think ultrasonic is one of the funnest technologies because it's using sound waves, right? It's something we can really relate to, like like the bat of automation. It's sending sound waves out and, and waiting for those sound waves to bounce back to the sensor. And the applications are almost identical to photoelectric, you know, detecting is an object there or not, or how far away is an object. What ultrasonic's really good at is clear objects or objects where... There's going to be a lot of dust and debris and dirt because a photo light could get, you know, the lens could get occluded and then it could be hard to, to send the light out of the sensor or to see the light come back. Ultrasonic is, has a hard time with real thin things like film. Like if you think of like a plastic coming off a roll going into a machine, it can, the sound waves can kind of vibrate the film and then you don't detect very well. The ultrasonic, you have there, what I love is it gives you a position, right? So you can get a really good analog position there and sensors really have two types of outputs most of the sensors you have there have discrete on off right is it there or is it not like a light switch in your house but you can get most any of these you can get every sensor on that wall virtually with an analog signal and the analog signal is that dimmer switch in our in our dining room right it allows us to have an actual measurement value or a control over the signal and so that i, I love on this display that you have that meter because it's really showing people any of these sensors can have that but ultrasonic's a good one to show it with and then last but not least the capacitive i, I love capacitive it's so cool we can use it to see through objects. Yeah, so capacitive, it's looking for capacitance, 
But if you know how capacitors, you know that the density of the object plays a big part of the capacitance of an object. So things like a styrofoam can trick it and have a hard time with it. Things like metal are really easy. <laughs> but it can be used to detect plastics and especially liquids. A capacitive sensors get used very often for like the high point of a tank and the low point of a tank. Now that we know about sensors, we need to work on some connection technologies. Click here to follow me over there.